Okay? See, this is where science makes its mistake. Science looks and says, okay, so you're here, your parents were here, their parents were here, their parents were here. But they don't trace it back to one. The Bible traces it back to one, right? They can't tell you how your parents and your grandparents, your great grandparents, and your great 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 great, great keep going on. Where it actually started at. They have no answer, but the Bible does. That when God breathed into Adam that breath of life, when Adam and Eve were able to bear children, that breath still comes from God. Amen. That is a miracle from God every time a child is born. Amen. David said, you knit me, as he is David Jeremiah, you knit me in my womb. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 143. Thank you, Rachel. Psalm 143, he said. Okay, <laughs> I, I think you're right. <laughs> so the spirit that returns to God in death is the breath of life. Nowhere in all of God's book does the spirit have any life, wisdom, or feeling after a person dies. It is the breath of life and nothing more. So what is a soul? We found out that a soul is you and I. We are living souls. That's the dust of the ground, the breath of life, Man became a living soul. Okay? Now, can souls die? Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 18. Let's look at verse 20. Ezekiel 18 verse 20. That says that the soul that sinneth will, there you go, surely... Now, isn't that the same words that God used back in Genesis? That if you touch it and eat it, you will surely die? Not that you would just die, but you will surely die. Meaning that, I want you to understand this, there's no misconceptions here. That the soul that sinneth, it will surely die. So, that word soul that's found in Ezekiel is the same word that you find when soul is used throughout the rest of the Old Testament. And you find that its counterpart in the Greek is the same word with the same meaning. Okay? So, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel 18.20. Now, let's look real quick at Revelation 16.3. Okay. Revelation 16.3. You got that, Ricky? Psalm 139. All four Psalms off. Four Psalms off. Okay. So Revelation 16:3. This is speaking of when the seven last plagues are poured out. Plague is poured out upon the ocean, and it says that what? It became blood as of a dead man. You keep reading. And every living creature in the sea died. What version are you reading from? No. What version are you reading? From? Oh, New King. The old King James says, every living soul. Okay? New King James uses the word creature because it's, uh, you know, but again, the old King James, every living soul. So, again, whether it is human or whether it is animals, that soul or that breath is that spark of life. And so, you take that spark away, what happens to it? It dies. Alright? So, now, according to God's word, souls do die. We are souls, and souls die. Job chapter 4, verse 17, write this down. Anybody have a finger in Job? Or can you find it real quick? Ricky, you got one of the Bibles that tells you where this book is? I got Job. Uh, Job chapter 4, verse 17. Do you have that, sir? Yeah, can you read it? Hold on, let him read it. Can you read that one? Okay, can you read it? Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? So when it describes man, does it say, shall immortal man be more just than God? No. no. Now listen. He knew the exact word he wanted to use. It says, does mortal man, is mortal man more just than God? 
because man is mortal and God is immortal. Make sure you know the difference there. Man does not have natural immortality. That's what Eve wanted. She wanted to become like God. Listen, what kept them alive? After Adam and Eve sinned, going back to Genesis, what did God have to do to the tree of life? He had to guard it. He had to guard it. And then, before the flood, He took it away. Why did He have to guard the tree of life? It says plainly, so that man would not eat of it and become an immortal sinner. You get that? Become an immortal sinner. So, you do not have natural immortality. Alright, so, only God is immortal. 1 Timothy 6, verses 15 and 16. The concept of an undying, immortal soul goes against the Bible, which teaches that the souls are subject to death. Do you know where the teaching of the immortality of the soul came from? It came from paganism. Look at early paganism, whether it's Babylonian mysticism, whether it's from the Egyptians, you can go back to Nimrod before the flood and the religion that he started because Babylonian religion was a continuation of what he started. And his main teaching was the immortality of the soul. So when the Christian church or churches teach the same thing, they're teaching paganism. You need to understand this. Because the Bible is clear that you are mortal. And that when you die, you sleep and you wait in your grave for Jesus to come. That on that day, what day? The last day. When this great judgment happens, the dead will be raised in Christ. Now we're talking about the judgment of the righteous. Okay? Because what happens to the wicked living at Christ's coming? They die, right? Mm -hmm. But they die asleep because they're going to be raised again after a thousand years. Okay? They don't die and then get sent to hell for a thousand years only to be brought up and be sent to hell again. Every teaching that we teach hinders on the correct understanding of the immortality and the non-immortality of the soul. You understand what I'm saying? Because hell, if hell is real, and you die and you go to hell, and there's been people burning in there for centuries and millennia, then our teaching is wrong. If our teaching is right, then there is no burning hell that's happening right now. And if there is no burning hell, then your whole view of whether you're a pre-millennial, post-millennial, mid-millennial, comes into play. Your tribulation outlook comes into play. How you believe the second coming of Christ is going to happen comes into play. How you interpret scripture comes into play. Everything hinges on the correct understanding of the state of the dead. You guys see that? That's why this is so important. Amen. Alright, so do good people go to heaven when they die? Turn with me to John chapter 5. Let's look at verses 28 and 29. John chapter 5. Can I continue to go on this afternoon? Yes. yes. Okay. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Say amen when you got it. Amen. Okay. So all who are in the graves... We'll hear his voice. And what? Come down? Now listen, again, the terminology is correct. It does not say all who are in the graves will come down. It says all who are in the graves will come forth. They will hear his voice. Whose voice? That's right, Jesus' voice, right? When do they hear his voice? At the second coming. Do you realize that when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he had to call him by name because if he just said, come forth, 
everybody would have came forth. That's why he said Lazarus and specifically gave his name. Okay, so the Bible tells you right here that all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Now, David, King David, King David was quite the character. He was an adulterer, he was a murderer, he was a liar. He was pretty much human, right? But what does the Bible say about David when he came to his relationship with God? A man after God's own heart. So would David be saved? Right, so David died, and he was a patriarch of patriarchs, right under Abraham. Don't you think if you went to heaven, David would be there? Yes. Right? Yes. Don't you think that if, when David died, if you went to heaven when you died, David would be there? Yes. What does the Bible say about David after death? Well, how do you know that? By Acts chapter 2, verse Do you have it, Ricky? Yeah. Say what the, the text is and give everybody a chance to go there. This is Acts, real important. Acts chapter 2, verse 29 says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you. What does that word freely mean? Another word can be honestly. Let me speak to you honestly. Freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. That's verse 29. Okay, now listen. So what you know from that verse is that David died, except for his fathers, because that's what it tells you in 1 Kings. David died, except for his fathers. But now, from the time David died to that time when Peter is speaking, the tomb of David is still there. They know where it is. They keep it clean. They adorn it. But what does it say about David himself? Where it says, yeah. David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself said, says himself, The Lord said at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. But what does it say in the first part of that verse? That David did not ascend, ascend into, into the heavens. And uh, Luke wrote this in, in the New Testament. So, Peter's telling you that David is buried and his grave is with us today, and that he did not ascend into heaven. Jesus said, nobody came from heaven but himself. Right? right? Mm -hmm. So listen, so if anybody would have been there, it would have been David. But yet the Bible tells you that David's grave is with us, and he never ascended into heaven. Okay, so. People do not go either to heaven or hell at death. They go into their graves, and they await the resurrection day. So how much does one know or comprehend after death? Well, let's turn to Ecclesiastes again. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. You know, I brought these texts to people who believe that when you die, you continue to live on. And they said, well, you can't believe Ecclesiastes because that was written by Solomon and Solomon wasn't inspired. Because, you know, you saw how you lived, right? Let me ask you a question. Is Ecclesiastes inspired? Yes. So what Ecclesiastes says here, what you're going to read, is it true or is this just the musing of Solomon in his fallen state? Okay, so that is Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. Then verse 6, and then verse 10. Diane, do you have that? Yes. Can you read that for me? For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Stop. The living know that they will die, but how much do the dead know? Nothing. Okay. But if you died and continued on and went to heaven, you would know something, right? And if you went to hell, you'd definitely know something, that you're in the wrong place. <laughs> but the Bible says the dead know not anything. They know nothing. So continue on. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So stop there. The dead have no more what? Memory. No, that first word is reward. reward. 
for. Isn't that what we look for? That if we know we're going to die, don't we have a hope that burns inside of us because we know that at death, that doesn't mean the end, that we know that in Christ, we will continue to be able to live, but it's after He comes the second time and raises us from the dead. But the Bible there says that that doesn't happen when they die. It is a future event. Because it says when you die, you have no more reward here in this life. So keep reading on. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share of in anything done under the sun. So this goes to show you that when you die, you do not haunt your, or haunt your house. If you were a, just a nasty person, and that was your neighbor, and they died, their spirit is still not there in their house. Okay? But is there such things as haunted houses? Yes. What haunts them? The spirit of dead people? No. Demons. Oh, I can give you some stories, but time is that I just want to go through this. Okay, so, now listen, it says, their love, their hatred, their envy have all perished, which is telling you they do not know what their loved ones are doing. They do not affect the life of their loved ones. They have nothing more to do with anything going on in the land of the living. Their thoughts have perished. They're resting in their grave. Okay? Is that clear? Is that text clear? Yes. Alright, so... Yeah, are you done? Is there some more? Okay. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. See what he's saying? He's saying that while you're alive, learn all that you can, work as hard as you can, and enjoy life as much as you can, because in the grave, it all comes to an end. But in Christ, there is hope. Jesus said that you don't wait for eternal life. He says you have eternal life. So this death is called a sleep because it is an unconscious state of, of rest. Very good, thank you. Okay, when you are asleep, do you know what's going on in your house? Do you know what's even going on in your room? When you are asleep and dead tired, time can pass like that. So when you die, it's the same thing. You don't know what's going on in the earth. You are resting in Christ. Now listen, this is the key here. You are resting in Christ. If Christ was able to take dust and form Adam, don't you think Christ can remake you out of nothing? So listen, if they bury you, your buried body will come back to life. But let's say that you were uh, shipwrecked out in the middle of the ocean, and before you were shipwrecked and died, a shark came and ate you. And he had a piece, and his friend had a piece, and 20 more had a piece. But can you not be resurrected because, you know, God won't know where all these pieces are? Those people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki who had the atomic bomb dropped on them and they were evaporated. And their shadows were still in the concrete. Don't you think God can bring them back? God is not bound by anything. God knows the very hairs of your head. And God can recreate you. Okay? This is why people were so freaked out about um, cremation. Because they didn't think back in the day that if you were cremated, God would be able to bring you back. If you died in a fire, what difference does it make? Okay? All right, so God says that the dead know absolutely nothing. But can't the dead communicate with the living? And aren't they aware of what the living are doing? So listen, here's some more text for you. Ecclesiastes 9, 6, we looked at that already. It says, so man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. 
They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. This is very clear. It says, a man lies down to talk about lying down in the uh, sleep of death. He will rise no more till the heaven, or he will rise not again until the heavens are no more. When will the end of this earth come? When the heavens are no more. At the second coming of Christ. When Christ will call the dead with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise first. This is not a new teaching just in the New Testament. This is from Old Testament to New Testament. There is singularity in God's teaching of the state of the dead. From beginning to end, God says that when you die, you will surely die. But in Christ, you have life. All right, so... So the heavens are no more, they will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. His sons, his sons come to honor, and he does not know it. They are brought low, and he does not perceive it. That's Job chapter 14. You can write this down. Job 14, verses 12 and 21. Ecclesiastes 9, 6, again says, Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. Okay, now, how many verses have I given you? Have I given you enough? Because I probably, there's 2,400 statements. 2,400 statements, okay? Have I given you enough, because I could keep you here all day, and all night, and tomorrow, and not exhaust this, but it's almost 12.30, and I'm not done yet, but I want to ask you, have I given you enough to see that when you die, you sleep? Because I want to ask you about this text in 1 Corinthians. Turn with it, actually, 2 Corinthians. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Now remember, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. Paul also wrote Thessalonians. So there's got to be continuity in all of his statements. And it's got to reconcile with every statement that I've read you already. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to give you context, so let's look at verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent that is this body, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. Now when you read this, this can give you a headache because this is pure Paul. Okay? And if you read it from the King James, it's better to take these verses and have other versions so you get a clearer understanding of what he's actually saying. Because Paul can give you a headache. What he's talking about here has to match with everything else we just read, right? So we've already made the case that when you die, you sleep. You don't have a conscience that lives on. So Paul is saying, look, in this body, in this tent that I have here, that persecution can come, and persecution will come, and you may give up your life. But we know that this life and this body isn't the one that matters the most. That we have an earthly body and an earthly habitation that we wait for, we long for, that we will get on that day that he spoke of in the prior letter that says, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but at the last trump, this mortal shall put on immortality. Okay. That is this heavenly body that he's talking about. Where is it at and where is it kept safe at? If you have faith in Jesus Christ and you die tomorrow, how do you know that Jesus will raise you on that day? Don't you put your trust in him? Amen. And what you have encased and entrusted to him, you know he will bring? That's what Paul's talking about here. It's very simple. Okay. 
For in this we grow, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we, verse 4, for we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. You confused now? Listen, what is he talking about? He's talking about that desire for this mortal to put on immortality. That death will finally be swallowed up. That we can finally say, oh death, where is your sin? Where is your victory? That's what he's talking about here. There is continuity in what he states in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Thessalonians as well. For we who are in this tent grown being burnt, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by what? Life. That word life is another word for immortality. Okay? Verse 5. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is who? God. Who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. This is why we groan, because we have the Spirit living in us, and the Spirit shows us what God has planned for us, that we were never meant to die, that in Christ we were meant to live forever. But not live forever in this tent, in this sinful body, but to live forever in righteousness, in immortality, and in purity. That's what God has in store for us. Okay, so, verse 6, so we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are what? Yes. While we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. Why? Because this body is mortal, and we look forward to that body that is immortal, and that only comes from God. Amen. So if we're in this body, we are absent from the Lord, and vice versa. If we are out of this body, we will be present with the Lord. When does that happen? When Jesus comes back and raises the dead from their graves. And in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, this mortal will put on immortality. Does that make sense to you guys? Amen. Okay, so listen. This next verse is very important because all this is hinged on faith. If I had an immortal soul, I wouldn't need faith. Because when I die, I'm either going to go here or there. Okay? But I need faith because I have to trust that even though I'm dead, God is going to bring me back. Do you understand why Paul had to write this? Because there were false teachers in the church saying that the resurrection had already happened. Or that it wasn't going to happen. The resurrection already happened. This is the beginning and the foundation for the secret rapture. It's not a new teaching. If you study into it, you find out where its origins come from. They can be traced all the way back to the days of the apostles. Okay? So, you need to have faith to trust that God is able to do what He says. Because these believers were seeing their loved ones die. And they didn't think there was hope for them. They didn't think they would be raised to life. And Paul set them straight. They didn't believe they were in heaven already. They believed that they were gone forever. So if you believe in the immortality of the soul, how do you explain that? He had to write to them that they will be raised from the dead. If they already died and was in heaven, he would have never had to write this. For we walk, verse 7, for we walk by what? Faith. And not by sight. Meaning that if I laid my loved one in the grave, I walk by faith knowing that that loved one will rise again at the second coming at the sound of Jesus' voice, at that last trumpet. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be what? Absent from the body, and there's that text that is always taken out of context, because all you hear is absent from the body, present with the Lord. 
that's not what it's saying. It's saying. What it's saying is that you must have faith that if you die, Christ will raise you from the dead, absent from the body, present with the Lord. When you die, all your work is over with. If you are suffering persecution,